Man, if you came and your faith is not encouraged already, there's something wrong. There's something wrong. And so hopefully today, hopefully today, God ministers to you through the word that he's given to me for us. It's meant a lot to me already. I've sought the Lord and he heard and he answered and he gave us a word for today. And I don't know who this is for. I don't know who this is for, um, if it's for someone in this room or whether someone online. Can we just give a shout out to everybody that's online? Let's let them know. We love them. We're all in this together. We're one house connected through technology. We don't want to forget about those. Even that will watch this on YouTube later. And... Um, yeah, I don't know what God's going to do through this, but I'm amazed that God can even use pesky, pagan, social media algorithms to get his word out. I, I thought about this this week, thought about all the things that get Googled, all the things that get Googled on Saturday night. But on Sunday, the Lord even uses Google to get the gospel out. Amen. What the devil uses for evil, God uses it for good. And there was a lot of stuff Googled on Saturday night. But today, through those same servers, God's word is going out, not just in this church, but all across the world, Thank, thanks to technology. Amen. We can spread the gospel Man, and God's got something for us today. Well, today we're going to be in the Old Testament. We're going to be in the Old Testament in the book of Joshua, in the book of Joshua. So if you've got your Bibles, go ahead and turn there. If you don't, we're going to have the scripture on the screen. Technology again, amen, it's a beautiful thing. And I'm just going to give us a little bit of a, a catch up, okay? Because the Bible, the Bible is not just random stories, and we've already kind of talked about this a little bit today. They're not just random stories all put together in here, but it's one story. And so I just want to give us a little bit of context about where we're going to be, and we're going to be talking about the Israelites. They've come out of Egypt. They've been in bondage for uh, many, many years, for centuries, and God has brought them out of Egypt. He's brought them to the Red Sea. He's brought them through the Red Sea, and um, they get to the promised land the first time, and Moses sends out 12 guys. God says to send 12 into the promised land to check it out, and only two come back with enough faith, believing that they can do it. And because of that, God makes the Israelites wander for 40 years um, until that generation dies off, and then the next generation can go in. And then Moses dies, and now God has put Joshua in charge of leading his people and so in Joshua chapter 1, God encourages um, Joshua, and he tells him many, many times to be strong and be courageous. I don't know how many times he says that in that chapter, but it's a lot. And then in chapter 2, the Israelites are positioned and ready to move forward into the promised land. And so Joshua sends two spies into the land. And we've got some scripture to read today, okay? Okay. And so y'all bear with me, but I love the word of God. Amen. And some of you didn't read any scripture this week, so I'm going to get you caught up right here and right now. And that's not an excuse to say, hey, I've done it for this week. I don't have to do it. No, no, I'm getting you caught up so you can then get on with it this week. And so Joshua chapter two, we're going to start in verse one. It says, then Joshua, son of Nun, secretly sent two spies from Shittim, Shatim, that's how you say that. And I'm not going to sound it out for you because we'll get into trouble. But he sent two spies from Shatim. Go, look over the land, he said, especially Jericho. So the assignment here was to look over the whole land, to look over everything. But he said, pay special attention to Jericho. Jericho is mentioned specifically. Pay special attention to Jericho. Jericho was strategic and God had something special in store in Jericho. Keep reading. So they went and entered the house of a prostitute named Rahab 
and stayed there. Now, people have wrestled with this passage for a long time. Well, was Rahab really a prostitute? You know, well, why did these men end up at the prostitute's house? And better yet, why'd they stay there? You know, lots of questions. Lots of questions around this, but I just wanted to point out a couple things, and I know we're only one verse in. We're going we're gonna to keep reading here in a second, okay? But just to set the, the groundwork here, Rahab was, in fact, a prostitute. I know if you, if you probably Googled this, and maybe you've been taught this, that, hey, Rahab was just an innkeeper. Some people like to say that and kind of just dismiss, you know, her past, dismiss, you know, what it was that she was into and what she did. But she was, in fact, a prostitute, because we look in the New Testament when she's mentioned the Greek word that is used for prostitute means prostitute. It's just pretty clear. Um, the one in the Old Testament in Hebrew, yes, it could mean innkeeper, but that's not really what the, the original intent was. But just to, to be specific, when she's talked about in the New Testament, prostitute means prostitute. And so let's just know that Rahab was in fact a prostitute. The second thing is there's no hint whatsoever of immorality between Rahab and these two spies. If you somehow come to that conclusion, you're reading too much into the text. Don't do that. And so the third thing is, is Rahab, because of her occupation, was in the business of hiding men. And so this was a great place for our spies to go to remain anonymous. And so let's keep reading in verse 2. It says, the king of Jericho was told, look, some of the Israelites have come here tonight to spy out the land. So the king of Jericho sent this message to Rahab, bring out the men who came to you and entered your house because they have come to spy out the land. Now, Jericho was on high alert, okay? So this this was something they were expecting. They had heard the stories, and we'll talk about this in a minute. They had heard the stories of how God had brought the Israelites out of Egypt, how he had brought them to the Red Sea, how he opened the Red Sea for them to pass through on dry land, and then how the Pharaoh's armies pursued them, and then God closed the Red Sea and destroyed that army, and then the Israelites pressed on, and then they defeated different kings and different armies throughout their wilderness journey. So they had heard, as people had come to Jericho, pass, passer, passer buyers, whatever, I know that's probably not a word, um, you know, they had heard the rumors of what God had done for his people, and so they knew that on their journey, they were next. And so Jericho is on high alert, and these two spies, they enter the city, and they're in an instant recognized. You know, they weren't very good spies, okay? And so they go into the city, and immediately they're noticed, and the guards, in my mind, this is how I read it, this isn't in the text, but the guards, a a chase ensues. And so they're going through the alleyways, they're jumping over things, they're tossing stuff behind them, and they're being chased, being pursued by these guards, and they duck into this brothel, you know, and they duck into this brothel and they, they go in and I'm picturing it this way, just like a good action movie. Okay. Are you with me? And so just like a good action movie, they duck into this brothel and because nobody in the brothel really wants their presence made known to anybody, they don't say anything to them. But Rahab realizes who they are and why they're there. Probably recognized their accent. There was something about them that gave them away. And so she grabbed them to the side, pulled them to the side, and she hit them away. And now the king is coming after him. He's sending people after them. And so here we are. They're, they're discovered. And it seems like the mission has failed. It seems like what they went to do can't happen because they went in to be spies, to not be noticed, and immediately that's not the case. The spy mission failed, so God's purpose could be accomplished. And so that's the first thing I want us to see. And sometimes we have an idea of how our life should play out. We have an idea of what things should happen and how they should happen and and in what time, but then God sometimes has a different plan. Anybody ever experienced that in their life? Maybe, maybe you were in college and you dated a pretty young lady and you thought, God, this is the one. 
This is the one. And then it doesn't work out. She breaks your heart and you think, God, what is going on? I thought this was the one you had for me. And then we fast forward 15, 20 years later and you run into her at Walmart and you're like, thank God that wasn't the one. Anybody ever experienced that? God sometimes has a different plan in mind. And that's a humorous example, but maybe it was a layoff that came that you didn't see coming. But through that layoff, God opened up other doors and other opportunities and put you in a place with greater responsibility and greater influence. God sometimes will allow what you're walking through to fail so his ultimate purpose can be accomplished. And so here these these spies go into the, the country, go into Jericho, and their mission fails, but God's purpose is going to succeed. Let's keep reading in verse four. We're gonna, we're gonna get through this, I promise. But the woman had taken the two men and hidden them. She said, yes, the men came to me, but I do not know where they had come from. At dusk, when it was time to close the city gate, they left. I don't know which way they went. Go after them quickly. You may catch up with them. But she had taken them up to the roof and hidden them under the, under the stalks of flax she had laid out on the roof. So the men set out in pursuit of the spies. They, 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 they did what Rahab said. They left and went in pursuit of the spies on the road that leads to the fords of the Jordan. And as soon as the pursuers had gone out, the gate was shut. Before the spies lay down for the night, she went up on the roof and said to them, I know that the Lord has given you this land and that a great fear of you has fallen on us so that all who live in this country are melting in fear because of you. We have heard now the Lord dried up the waters of the Red Sea for you when you came out of Egypt and what you did to Sion and Og, the two kings of the Amorites east of the Jordan, whom you completely destroyed. When we heard of it, our hearts melted in fear and everyone's courage failed because of you. For the Lord your God is God in heaven above and on the earth below. Now then, please swear to me by the Lord that you will show kindness to my family because I have shown kindness to you. Give me a sure sign that you will spare the lives of my father and mother, my brothers and sisters, and all who belong to them, and that you will save us from death. And they said to her, our lives for your lives, the men assured her, if you don't tell tell what we are doing, we will treat you kindly and faithfully when the Lord gives us the land. So she let them down by a rope through the window, for the house she lived on was part of the city wall. Look at that. Even where she was located was perfectly placed for God's purpose. And she said to them, go to the hills so the pursuers will not find you. Hide yourselves there three days until they return and then go on your way. Now the men had said to her, this oath you made us swear will not be binding on us unless we enter the land you have. And you have tied this scarlet cord in the window through which you let us down. And unless you have brought your father and mother, your brothers and all your family into your house, if any of them go outside your house into the street, their blood will be on their own heads. We will not be responsible. As for those who are in the house with you, their blood will be on our head if a hand is laid on them. But if you tell what, you are, what we are doing, we will be released from the oath you made us swear. Agreed, she replied, let it be as you say. So she sent them away and they departed and she tied the scarlet cord in the window. I want to speak today on moving past your past. Moving past your past. Heavenly Father, I come to you. I thank you for this opportunity we have to be yet again in your house, in your presence. The opportunity to give you praise to sing songs, to remember your sacrifice on the cross. God, for everything that you've done already today, I pray that you speak now to your people through me. I give you my mouth, I give you my hands, my feet, my whole body. God, would you use me like only you can. God, these are your words, not my words. Move today. And all God's people said, amen. Amen. 
Well, as a pastor, I'm in the business of meeting people. It comes with the territory. We're in the people business. And so, you know, I meet people all the time, not just at church. You know, I meet people at church, talk to people at church, but I meet people in the community. And, and when you meet somebody for the first time, there's two questions that are generally asked. And you may even know them off the top of your head. Generally speaking, you say, hey, what's your name? And then you ask, what do you do? What's your name? And what do you do? And see, as a culture, so much of who we are is wrapped up in what we do. And you can learn a lot about someone by what they do, but what they do is not who they are. Now, that's a lot. And a lot of different things move it there. So I'm going to say it again. In our culture, so much of who we are is wrapped up in what we do. And you can learn a lot about somebody by what they do, but what they do is not who they are. And so in our story today, we meet Rahab, the prostitute. There in verse 1, right off the get-go, we know what her name is, and we know what she does. From verse one, right out of the gate. But see, there was more to her story. There was more to Rahab than just what her name was and what she did. There's so much more to your story. And there's some of you today, you're here and you don't like who you are. You don't like where you're at. You don't like, you know, the person that you saw in the mirror this morning as you were getting ready and putting your makeup on and getting your hair did and doing all the things, picking out the right outfit so you can come and pretend to be something that you're not. And in the process, you look in the mirror and you really don't like the reflection that's looking back at you. But today, I want to tell you, and again, there's someone here that needs to hear this, that you are more than just a name. You are more than just an occupation. You are more than just a job title. You are more than just your past. You are more than what you struggle with. You're more than your addiction. You're more than what other people say you are. You are who God says you are. And I don't know who needs to hear that today, but God says you are loved. You are seen. You are known. The psalmist, psalmist puts it perfectly when he says, in my mother's womb, you knit me together. You knew me. You knew me. And, and sometimes God knows us better than we know ourselves because he knit you together. He also says in that same verse, in that same passage, that you are fearfully and you're wonderfully made. But see, the devil will like to define you by your past. But what God wants to do is leverage your past. And sometimes we like to hide from our past. We like to deny our past. But what I want to say today is let God leverage your past. Let him use your past for a purpose. And, and it, it reminds me of this. And you don't have to raise your hand if you've ever been to one of these meetings. But in, in AA meetings, in Alcoholics Anonymous, there's a famous greeting that they're known for. And you see this, even if you haven't been to a meeting, you've probably seen it in a TV show, you've seen it in a movie. They say, hi, my name is so-and-so, and I'm an alcoholic. And that is a, a legendary greeting. And throughout the program, they continue to introduce themselves at that, even when they've moved past that issue, when they've moved past that struggle. It's not a badge of shame, it's a badge of honor that they wear because it points to where they used to be, and now they're here, and it tells everybody that, hey, I'm not that anymore, but they're not hiding from it. They're professing it because it's a testimony of where they've come from, and it was through faith that Rahab was able to move past her past, and so can we. We can move past our past and step forward into a future that is filled with purpose. God has great things he wants to do through each and every one of us, but we can't step forward if we're stuck. 
And so many people are stuck, stuck in the past, stuck struggling with the same sins, walking in the same shame, dealing with the same guilt, struggling with blaming other people, blaming your father for walking out on you, blaming that ex for cheating on you, blaming God even at times for taking that loved one from you What in what you thought was too soon. We're, we're blaming people. We're not forgiving people. We're just stuck. We're stuck, and sometimes you just have to let go and let God. And I know some of you are saying, well, Pastor Jonathan, you don't understand. You don't understand my story. You don't understand where I came from. You don't understand what I'm dealing with and what I'm struggling with. Well, let me just say this. I might not understand, but look at Rahab. Let's look at our our story today. She didn't have it easy. She didn't have it. It wasn't a walk in the park for her. She was a prostitute. And so we know, again, she, we know she was a prostitute and we know where she was from. She was from Jericho. So I just want us to, we don't know a lot about her past. Scripture doesn't really say that. They just say, here's Rahab and she was a prostitute. And then they tell this story that we're gonna look at today. So we don't know a lot about her past, but there's some things that we can draw from it. So as a prostitute, her job was a lowly one. It was low on the totem pole. Also, as a prostitute, she didn't have a husband to provide for her and care for her. And she also lived alone and isolated and shunned by society. You know, she was pushed to the, to the outside. And so if you're here today and you're like, man, my story wasn't easy. Rahab's story wasn't easy. Also, she was from Jericho. Not only was she a prostitute, but she was from Jericho. This is a pagan country that worshiped false gods and the worship of the one true God was not promoted or encouraged at all. And so she didn't have it easy there. To, to bring this all into context, she didn't grow up in church. She didn't grow up in church. She didn't go to Sunday school. She didn't come to Stillwater's Kids. She didn't go to youth group on Wednesday night. She didn't go to Christian school. She didn't have everything handed to her. No, she was about as far away from God as anybody can get. But despite that, God knew exactly where she was. And someone here today, you're thinking the same thing. God doesn't. God doesn't know where I am. There's no way God sees me. There's no way God understands me. But if you're hearing my voice today, he knows exactly where you are and he has you right where he wants you to be to hear his word and have you step past your past and into a life of purpose. And I don't know who that is, But somebody, somebody needs to hear that today. Now, that doesn't mean, that doesn't mean it's going to be easy, okay? That doesn't mean you're not going to face opposition. Rahab faced opposition. Again, she lived in Jericho. Nobody believed like she did. Nobody had the faith that she had. She was surrounded by opposition. But sometimes we have to push past that opposition, and it can be painful, it can be exhausting, and it doesn't happen in an hour. It won't happen by the time we leave church today and you get to Cracker Barrel or wherever it is that you're gonna go eat lunch today. You're, you're not gonna be moved past your past by then. It doesn't happen in an hour. It doesn't happen in days and weeks. It could take months. It could take years to fully move past your past because transformation takes time. Transformation takes time. And depending on the extent of the transformation that needs to take place, that will determine how much time it takes. There's a, a guy in our church. I won't say his name or put his picture up on the screen, but I called him this week because I was kind of thinking about this idea of transformation takes time. And he came to mind because he used to be a bodybuilder, which is something that I don't know much about. And I don't know about you. I don't know if there's any other bodybuilders in the room. You can probably look at me and tell, oh, this guy, he's not really working too much in that transformation department, okay? Um, But I I called this guy up and I said, hey, man, you know, at what point 
and, and he's, he doesn't bodybuild anymore. He's kind of moved into another season of his life. And, um, but when he did, I asked him, I said, hey, from the point you decided and made a conscious decision to pursue bodybuilding, from that moment you made that decision to the first time you walked up on stage in your first competition, about how much time did that take of preparation? He, he texted me back and he said, about three years. And I said, man, you're more man than me. I've probably given it about three hours. Been like, okay, I'm going to lunch, okay? And so three years. And again, um, I, I saw pictures of him in the competition. I'm like, man. And uh, the, the work that had to go into you know, not just working out, but a total lifestyle change of watching what he eats and being in the gym and working out and sculpting and then going to competitions. Man, his whole life revolved around this thing because transformation takes time. It's not easy. And so I'm not up here trying to preach a message about, hey, move past your past, raise your hand today, and everything's going to be golden tomorrow when you wake up, because that's not the case. That's not how it works. Transformation takes time, but at some point, you have to make a conscious decision to say, God, I'm tired of this. I'm going to move forward and step into the purpose that you have for me. Enough is enough, and Rahab reached that point in her life, and there's several things in this text about Rahab's faith that I want us to look at, and the first is this. I want to talk about courage. Courage. See, it took a lot of courage for Rahab to risk her life to help these spies. She put her life on the line. She put what little bit of reputation that she had on the line. She put uh, her country, uh, her country's view of her on the line to help these spies out. Look at this in Joshua 2 verse 4. It says, but the woman had taken the two men and hidden them. She said, yes, the men came to me, but I did not know where they had come from. At dusk, when it was time to close the city gate, they left. I don't know which way they went. Go after them quickly. You may catch up with them. Rahab lies. Now, we're not going to get into the ethical debate here of whether or not this was a white lie or really was it a lie or how did God feel about the lie? We know that God doesn't condone lying. Well, does he condone it during war times because his people were, you know, in jeopardy? Yes, he could have provided another way if she wouldn't have lied, but she lied. Okay, she lied. Let's just call a spade a spade. She lied. But I think this is proof that regardless of how you, you view this, God can even use your mess ups to bring about his purpose if you surrender it to him. And so she lies. She put her, puts her life on the line to help these two spies. And this wasn't, this wasn't a little bit of courage. This was a lot of courage because if she got caught, she would meet the same fate they met. They'd just kill her and then just go on with their day. So she literally put her life on the line. Moving past your past and putting your faith in God takes courage. It takes resolve. It takes determination to say enough is enough. I don't care what everybody else around me says. I don't care how strong these feelings are. I don't care how long I've dealt with this. I don't care how screwed up my situation is. I'm going to step forward and believe that through faith, God can move me from a life of paralysis to a life of purpose. He can move us from a life of paralysis, being stuck in the same old rut for weeks and months and years. Some of you have been fighting the same thing for 15 years and enough is enough. Now it's not gonna be easy, but it's gonna take courage and God can do it. He can move you from a life of paralysis to a life of purpose. And know though, you're gonna have to make some sacrifices. You're going to have to make some sacrifices. There's going to be relationships that you have to put on hold or just cut off completely. There's going to have to be people you remove from your life, voices that have been encouraging you in the wrong direction. You have to cut it off. 
You have to put it behind you. There's gonna be family that's not gonna understand. They, they might laugh at you. You might have to move to a new place. You might have to just change your cultural context altogether. You're gonna be surrounded by opposition. Again, Rahab was in Jericho, surrounded by opposition all the way around her, but she said, I believe and I have the faith. And now she's got an opportunity right in front of her to move past her past. Y'all know, I talk about my parents a lot. My dad's a pastor. A lot of y'all have met him. He's been here before. He's going to be watching this later. Um, And he was, he's been a pastor for decades. Um, He got saved when he was 17, 18. I can't remember. He'll probably correct me after he watches this. Um, But he was, as he used to say, um, he was a, a, a dope addict. Um, He was a maggot infested hippie. He says all these crazy things about his life before Jesus. And then he got saved towards the end of high school. But he went on to business school um, to pursue taking over um, my granddad's business. My granddad managed the downtown airport in Columbia, South Carolina for decades. And he was grooming my dad, preparing my dad. He was paying for his business school and dad was pursuing that. And then God called him to preach. And when he called him to preach, dad said, yes. And so then he went to his parents and he tells the story of how he told them one day that God had called him into ministry and that he was going to surrender his life to preach. He was going to drop out of business school and pursue this. And they said, well, if that's what you're going to do, you're going to pay for it on your own. And they withdrew all their support financially. He faced opposition. Now, praise God, my grandparents came to know Jesus and through his testimony, number one. And, and so my, my granddad, he also is going to be watching this probably because he always asks me for the link to the YouTube when it goes up. And uh, he's a proud papa. And uh, so I can say, thank God they came to know Jesus. But back then they didn't know Jesus and they withdrew that support from my dad. And he didn't, he didn't ask and beg and plead. He knew that if God had called him to do this, that he would provide the way. But the courage it took to say, hey, I had this whole thing planned out. I had this whole roadmap to life. I had it made. And now God said, nope, I got a different agenda. You're going to go this way and you're not going to rely on your earthly father. You're going to rely on your heavenly father and no, it's not going to be easy. Yes, you're going to have opposition. Yes, people are not going to understand, but this is what I've called you to. And he followed and he trusted and he obeyed and God made it happen. God made it happen, but it took courage and courage takes faith and faith is fixed on the promises of God. Faith is fixed on the promises of God. There are times where life is so chaotic, it's so uncertain, you don't know what's going on around you and the only way you're gonna get through it is to open up God's word and find his promises that will never fail. They're always true, yesterday, today, forever. And you just have to remind yourself of those truths that are in scripture. And I don't have time to get into it all today. And I don't know what it is that you struggle with. Maybe it's temptation, maybe it's a struggle with sin, but God promises that there is no temptation that will overtake you. There's nothing that you can't handle. He will make a way of escape when the time comes. He promises that in scripture. Maybe you're here today and you're like, I feel so alone. Nobody is with me. Everybody's left my life. And God says, I will never leave you or forsake you. Or maybe you're here today, you've lost your job and you're so uncertain about what tomorrow's gonna hold or where that next paycheck is gonna come from or how you're gonna feed your kids. But God says, hey, if I clothe the flowers, if I do that, that, then I'm good. Why would I not provide for you? If I'm going to take care of nature and those things I've created, why would I not take care of you? And so the scriptures are full of his promises. In 2 Corinthians 1 20, put this verse up on the screen. It says, for no matter how many promises God has made, they are yes 
in Christ. And so through him, the amen is spoken by us to the glory of God. So matter, no matter what it is that you're going through, no matter what it is that you're facing, you're like, hey, I just can't get through it. I can't get over this. This just has me stuck. There's no way God has provided a way. It just takes faith. And it's going to take some guts and it's going to take courage, but that courage is fixed in faith and that faith comes through the promises of God. So let the promises of God fuel your faith. Rahab's faith took courage, but secondly, it took confession. I want to talk about confession for a second. Rahab confessed her faith to the two spies. She told them that she had heard the stories of all that God did for the Israelites. If you remember, we're not going to read all this scripture again, but she said, hey, I've heard about how God brought you out of Egypt, how he brought you to the Red Sea, how he opened up the Red Sea so you could go through on dry land. I've heard about how God led you to defeat these different kings and different countries, and we all heard of it. Look at this in, in Joshua 2, 11. It says, when we heard of it, she's talking about her and the rest of Jericho. When we heard of it, our hearts melted in fear and everyone's courage failed because of you. For the Lord, your God, is God in heaven above and on the earth below. See, Rahab was from a culture where they worshiped multiple gods and worshiped um, multiple beings and entities, but none of them could provide like God can provide. And she had heard these stories and believed, and she said, I know that the Lord is God. And I want to talk about this, just teach you a little bit here about scripture. And maybe you already know this. If you already know this, you can say amen. But I know there's people in here that don't know this. When you look at scripture, can we put that last scripture back up on the screen? He says, says this, when we heard of it, our hearts melted in fear and everyone's courage failed because of you for the Lord, your God. Notice how the word Lord is in all caps. Okay, so we notice that. That's not a typo. Patrick didn't make a mistake. That's what it's supposed to say. For the Lord, your God. She is saying, not just any God, because she knew a lot of God. She knew of a lot of gods in her culture, but she's saying, the Lord God. We could put Yahweh right there. She named him. She said, the Lord, your God. Yahweh. Yahweh is God in heaven above and on the earth below. And so she wasn't just saying, hey, your God is good, just like all these other gods are good that I worship. No, I'm forsaking all these others and I'm looking to this one. His name is Yahweh. He's not just some random God. He's got a name. He's got a name above any other name, Yahweh. I'm looking to Yahweh. And like Rahab, we live in a culture flooded by other gods. We live in a culture flooded by false gods. Now, you're not just going to find little statues. You know, you might find statues at the gas station or wherever, but our culture is not inundated by little statues. No, they look a little bit different. And sometimes they're not as obvious because we don't worship Baal, but we do worship our bank account. We do bow to our bank account. And when it gets to the bottom, we'll put more faith in how many dollars are in our checking account than our faith is in God. And we may not worship statues, but we worship status and success. And we live in a culture, we've got idols too. We've got gods too, little g gods. We live in a world full of false gods that we think will provide for us. And Rahab grew up worshiping gods that would never provide for her. And I'm here to tell you, if you put your faith in these things, in status, in success, in a relationship, in your money, whatever it is, if you're putting your faith in that, it's not gonna last. It's not gonna last. Now, money's important. We need money to survive and to eat, but it's God that gives you the job. It's God that provides for you. It's God that lets your feet work and lets your hands work. It's God that provides for you. It's God that provides for you. And she had courage and believed and had faith, but she had to confess it with her mouth. First John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us 
our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Romans 10, 9 says, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Moving, or maybe you're here today, maybe you're here today and you feel stuck. Stuck in something. I don't know what it is. I don't know your story. I don't know what it is you battle with. We all have stuff that has a tendency to get us stuck, to get us stuck. And maybe today, the first step you need to take is to confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord. If you've never, if you've never done that, today's the day. Today's the day. That's step one. And it takes courage. It's going to take guts. It's going to take a, a deep resolve within you to say, hey, I don't understand everything that's happening to me. I don't understand that everything that has happened to me. But I have faith and I believe that Jesus Christ is Lord. And scripture says, if you confess with your mouth, he is faithful and just to forgive you. And so today, make this the time that you confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord. And, and you know what, what scripture promises? God promises in scripture that if you do that, he will take your sin, he will take your struggle, he will take your shame and everything that goes along with that and he will cast it as far as the east is from the west. Scripture goes on in another place to say that he will put it into the depths of the sea, never to be seen are heard of again. And then the old country preacher used to say, and then God puts up a no fishing sign. <laughs> but if you put your faith in Jesus, he will take everything that has weighed you down and kept you stuck and kept you paralyzed for years and years and years and years, and he will cast it as far as the east is from the west and put it into the depths of the sea, never to be heard from again. But you have to confess with your mouth. It takes courage, it takes confession. And lastly, that led to a covenant. That led to a covenant. Joshua 2, 12 through 13. Actually, that's a typo. Joshua 2, verse 14. It says, our lives for your lives, the men assured her. If you don't tell what we are doing, we will treat you kindly and faithfully when the Lord gives us the land. So she let them down by a rope through the window for the house she lived in was of the city wall. She said to them, go to the hills to the pursuers will not find you. Hide yourselves there three days until they return and then go on your way. Now the men had said to her, this oath you make, or this oath you made a swear will not be binding on us unless we enter the land you have, and you have tied this scarlet cord. That's important. We're going to talk about that in a second. You have tied this scarlet cord in the window through which you let us down. The spies at Rahab made a covenant. They made a covenant with each other, and that covenant was represented by this scarlet cord in her window. And there's a couple things about this scarlet cord that I want us to see. The first was this. It was evidence to Joshua and the rest of Israel when they came in to take Jericho. It was evidence to spare that house because these spies went back, told Joshua, hey, here's the plan. This is Rahab. She's helping us out. She's putting this scarlet cord in her window. If we see that, leave it alone. Don't touch it. We're going to spare that house and spare that family. And, and ironically, this scarlet cord was probably evidence of her occupation. And she didn't let the shame of her, and the sin of her past stop her from being used by God. She put it in the window. She said, hey, if this, what it, if this, what's it, if this is what it takes, I'm going to put this scarlet cord here. I don't care what anybody says about it. I don't care what uh, the Israelites think of me, but I believe in God and I'm here to help fulfill his purpose for my life. She put the scarlet cord in the window. The second thing is it was a symbol of the blood of Jesus. 
And we don't have to get into this, but it reminded me of the blood on the doorpost, you know, when, when God passed over uh, those houses during the first Passover when God was, before he led them out of Egypt during that 10th plague in Egypt. It was a symbol of the blood of Jesus, and it was also a symbol of the scarlet line that would lead to Jesus. And if you remember all the way back, all the way back to the first verse of today's text, Joshua said, hey, go into the land, search it out, search the whole land, let us know what you think, but pay special attention to Jericho. God had something special in Jericho. And that something special was Rahab. Out of all the other lands and all the other places that they went, out of all the other people in that city, there was one. And her name was Rahab. And I think this is proof, proof that God will go after the one. He will go after the one. And yes, God used Rahab to bring a victory for the Israelites because it was through her helping and, you know, harboring these fugitive spies that they were able to survive being found out and they were able to go back to Joshua and tell him everything that they had experienced and she made a way um, for that to happen. And so, yes, God used her in that immediate battle. But when the, the battle of Jericho was over, when the walls came tumbling down and all that was over after they had pillaged and everyone else was dead and the Israelites took Jericho. In the wake of that battle, when the dust cleared and settled and her family emerged out of that, out of their house, they went on, it says Rahab found a home and stayed with the Israelites. And she went on, she married this guy named Salmon. I guess that's how you say his name. It looks like salmon, but I don't think that's how they said it. And, and some people believe that this man was one of the spies. There's no definitive proof, but that's what history sort of tells us in some other, in some other areas. But she married this man, and they went on to give birth to a son named Boaz. And then Boaz married a woman named Ruth. And together, together, they were the great grandparents of David, King David. And then centuries and centuries later, another king came in the city of David. A savior, the Messiah, was born. God had something special in Jericho. And it was the scarlet line that led all the way to Jesus. And, and here's the thing, here's the thing. Matthew writes about it in his, in his gospel. And he has this genealogy, which is just a big word for a long list of people in history. And Rahab is mentioned along with other women, scarred, and, and men scarred by sin and by shame. And it's proof that God can use those things to bring about a purpose. And when people wrote genealogies back then, they didn't include things like that, but Matthew did, because he said it's so very important to see how God can take your past and leverage it for his purpose. you have to surrender it to him. There was something special in Jericho and her name was Rahab. And I believe that there's someone special here today. And I don't know who it is. I don't know what it is that you're holding on to that has you stuck but I'm calling you to leave a life of misery and step into a miracle because God can do it. 
but you got to step. You got to move. You got to go forward. You got to have courage. You got to confess and enter into the covenant relationship with your heavenly Father. Every eye bowed, every head bowed, every eye closed today. Where are you today? Are you stuck in the past? Have you ever truly confessed that Jesus Christ is Lord? If you haven't today, I want to make an opportunity for you to do that. And so right now, in this moment, if you're here today and you said, hey, I'm stuck. I don't know why my life is the way it is. I don't know why I'm struggling with this and going through this, but I want to step out in faith and believe today and confess with my mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord. You can pray a prayer like this. Heavenly Father, I come to you as a sinner in need of a Savior. I believe that Jesus died so I could be forgiven and rose again that I might have life. Today, I receive that new life. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. If you prayed that prayer today, I'm going to ask you to have courage right now. In this room, online, you can click the button, but in this room, when I count to three, to raise your hand. One, two, three. If you raise that, if you prayed that prayer today to receive Jesus, just raise that hand. Raise that hand in faith. Maybe you're struggling with something else. Maybe you are a believer in Jesus and you need prayer. We have the prayer team available. We would love to pray with you, talk with you, help walk through whatever we can with you. They're right over here to your right, to my left. If you're here today and it's your first time, we'd love for you to fill out the card that's in the seat pocket. If you got saved today, if you prayed that prayer, please fill that card out. Take it to the back, to the next steps area. Somebody will be there or find somebody with a lanyard, hand it to them. If you're interested in baptism, check that box. If you're interested in anything else, if you're interested in taking the next step class, you can check the appropriate box on that card. Same thing online, click the link, fill out the card. We'd love to get to know you and find out how we can help you take your next step at church. I'm so glad I came to church today. Are you glad you came to church today? Amen. Let's stand to our feet. I'm going to pray for us and we'll be dismissed. I thank you so much for being here in the house today. I believe God's got great things for each and every one of us. We just have to have the faith to step out and believe God for great things. So let me pray a prayer of blessing over you. Father, we thank you for the opportunity we've had to be in your house today. God, I pray blessing over each household here today, watching online, wherever they are. God, would you meet their needs, provide for them like only you can. God, would you give us a great week and bring us back next week to your house to give you praise and to give you worship. God, love on your people this week. I pray a prayer of blessing over each and every one of them. In Jesus' name, all God's people said, amen. We hope the message you heard today encouraged you and strengthened you in your walk with Jesus wherever you are. If you know of someone that could use today's message, be sure to share it with a friend and also hit the subscribe button so you don't miss a single message. If you feel led today to give towards the mission and vision, you can do so by clicking the give button on the screen. Thanks so much for joining us and we'll see you next time.